Kaylee, did you know that Kenya saw more than 970 million cyber threat events in the first quarter of 2024? Wow, I did not. However, I did know that Kenya's president, William Ruto, plans to accelerate his nation's technological progress by forging partnerships with the U.S. and three major tech companies. Well, I tell you, you know, so this is pretty cool because a lot of the news in the cyber world that comes out of even developed countries in Africa, right? It's it's how bad things are or mm-hmm. jokes, right? That that in a weird way, you know, almost seem insensitive about Nigerian yeah. princes. And so Agreed. it's good to see, I think the Carnegie Endowment had this article that we were kicking around with each other. And mm-hmm. it's good to see, you know, regular news, not even good news, but just regular news that treats the partnerships between the U.S. on the one hand and um, uh, African countries on the other, like real news, as opposed to something where it seems like the United States is complaining about Absolutely. something that happened in Africa. And so this reporting had sort of two prongs to it. One was the United States government's relationship with the government of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then the other was Cisco and some other U.S. businesses having um, relationships with the University of Nairobi. Um, And this all seems like pretty good. I I mean, it all on the whole, more partnership and engagement seems to me like good news, Kaylee. What, how do you read it? Yeah, absolutely. I I totally agree with you that it's it's very nice to have some positive news about um, that relationship with a nation in Africa. Um, I think it's mutually beneficial for both sides of the coin, both Kenya and in a larger sense, Africa as that um, influence kind of uh, ripples out and it's mutually beneficial for us as well, because it aligns with our own interests in promoting global stability and economic partnerships and all that good stuff. Yeah. So I think that the main headline was in the conversations that President Biden and his team had with President Ruto and his team that came out of it with Kenya committing to the framework for responsible state behavior in -hmm. cyberspace. And I think that's sort of the big news. And then the university system in Nairobi kind of came behind that and put together some more lasting partnerships with Cisco. And I think there were partnerships also with Google that were announced on incident response. But to me, to me, the $970 million, 970 million cyber threats in one quarter, I wouldn't want to be the, you know, wouldn't want to be the intern who had to calculate all those particular (laughs) cyber threats. I'm hoping that was automated. Yeah, I, I would hope so too. Um, and if it's if it hasn't been, then hopefully it will be in the future after after these partnerships. <laughs> I it, go ahead. But that was one of the big. So the big um, the story for the last year among sort of responsible conversation with about Africa's development has been about the mobile economy, and that mm-hmm. instead of building out broadband in a lot of countries, it has leapt right to um, a mobile infrastructure, and the security for mobile apps is very different from you know. Mm-hmm the usual security that we think about through um, secure corporate networks, for example. And yeah. a lot a lot of that conversation that was happening between the U.S. companies on the one side and the Kenyan government and its universities on the other had had to do with this, largely because in cap, Kenya is one of the leading African digital economies. And so those problems of, of mobile security are being addressed first, right? They're, yeah. not, they're not sort of, it's not forcing... You, the U.S. isn't forcing network security where it's not really needed if we're going to go right to mobile and mobile app securities. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think this is also a great example of um, what the role is between public and private and how they can partner together to overall just enhance capabilities and sort of create this robust digital economy and infrastructure that Kenya is hoping for. Yeah, and I think they had a... Uh, Microsoft did create a partnership too, where they're agreeing to train um, some Kenyan nationals in cybersecurity skills. They're offering some free online certifications, and they're also going to support some AI AI training and research. And I think, you know, there's um, for those companies, there's a lot of interest in one, you know, network stability, but mm-hmm. two also in you know creating new uh, partners, both mm-hmm. um, in residential uses and in commercial uses, and so. It seems like an example, at least to try, of uh, communication between the corporate sector in the U.S. and and the apparatus in Kenya that we're talking about. 
Yeah, I think uh, I would like to see a next step of um, taking that education um, to the public of like the people of Kenya and further out into Africa, because, you know, it, it's good to start with the technical minded first so that we can get these frameworks and infrastructures in place. But ultimately, the way you're going to get 970 million down is if if you you know educate the public the average user i tell you, the other place at least we've seen some through our clients in, in africa i've seen some engagement on the mobile side and mobile app side and we've sort of had conversations with them around some of the issues here but one of the other markets where i do some work which is kind of similar to this is colleges and universities because mm-hmm. it's becoming increasingly hard with every year to get engagement through laptops because mm. students are so used to using their phones for everything. Interesting. And so sometimes they're taking, you know, a, a website that was designed to be accessed on a laptop in a secure way for student engagement, either yeah. in the classroom or some financial um, component of the relationship between a student and the university. And it's translating poorly from a security perspective to apps. Mm. Right. And it's kind of silly, but it's like, okay, we have essentially yep. a mobile phone based economy in some colleges and universities now. Like you don't have yeah. people who if they have the choice between doing it on their phone versus doing it um, you know, in a different way, they're gonna do it on their phone. And and yeah. you've got to make sure if you're in charge of that that whatever security you have is translating to the way they're actually doing it. Not the yeah. way that they might have done it in the late nineties. Yeah, so. and that's historically been kind of a weak spot <laughs> for cybersecurity too. So they've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm your host here, folks, Jack Clabby. I'm a cybersecurity attorney at Carleton Fields. With me, as always, is Kaylee Melton. Kaylee's a vice president for U.S. remote publishing teams at Know Before. Today, we will chat with Moretta Moravitz. Moretta is the principal cybersecurity engineer and engage lead at MITRE. As the engage lead, Moretta focuses on cyber denial, deception, and adversary engagement. When she's not outsmarting cyber criminals, Moretta can be found at her dance studio or eagerly awaiting her Hogwarts letter. This is going to be a lot of fun and a fantastic conversation. Stay tuned. We'll dive right in after a short break. Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that introduces you to some of the top talent in the world of cybersecurity. All right, and welcome back. Our guest today is Moretta Moravitz. Moretta, welcome to No Password Required. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. All right, so Moretta, you know, Kaylee and I want to talk to you about sort of how you got into the business and in the early years, but let's start with where you are now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your current role at, Mar- at MITRE? Yeah, so I get to wear a bunch of different hats at MITRE, which I really enjoy. So Um, In one hat, I am the lead for what's called MITRE Engage, which is our external set of resources helping organizations to think differently about cyber and to how to incorporate cyber denial, deception, and adversary engagement. Um, I wear a sort of similar hat where I get to also help with our projects and research work, um, helping guide teams who are implementing these technologies um, and helping our sponsors be able to kind of more effectively use the technology. Um, and then I also get to wear a people management hat. So I am both a what we call a group lead, which is sort of like a first line manager helping staff, um, as well as um, what's called a capability area lead. So helping uh, MITRE sort of direct people and resources around cyber deception and adversary engagement. Oh, wow, that's great. So yeah, it, it's... It's not only a subject matter expert, it's a subject matter expert and all these other things that you have that you keep on your plate. Yeah, I really like the diversity of having different things to occupy my time and be able to kind of approach the problem from all angles. Um, I think in so many ways, cyber is both a technology problem and a people problem. You know, how do we have the right staff? How do we have trained staff? Um, And so getting to kind of tackle the problem from both implementing the technology and helping grow the 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 body of people who can help um, be those implementers in the future is really exciting to me. Moretta, can you share with us a little bit about your career path, about how you got to where you are? Yeah. So I actually started as an intern at MITRE. Um, So my very first internship um, in college was with with MITRE. 
I was in a software engineering role, so completely different from the, the type of work that I get to work on now. Um, learned a couple things that summer. Uh, first and foremost being I am terrible at uh, UX design and should never be allowed to do <laughs> UX design. Um, so that was a really great learning lesson. Um, but one of the things that I also learned that summer is MITRE has a bunch of different um, sort of technical talks for folks to be able to attend. Um, and I attended one on cyber and it was the first time um, that I really heard this term cyber. And like, you know, we had some courses back at school, but I hadn't taken any of them. And so thought that this concept sounded really interesting, that there was a lot more to explore. Went back to school, took every cyber related course that I could, uh, <laughs> returned to MITRE uh, the following summer, but this time in sort of a cyber software focused internship. Um, got to kind of see another side of it, learned that, you know what, maybe the software side isn't quite where I want to be, but the cyber side is. So when I returned full time to MITRE after that, it was much more in kind of um, more technical reverse engineering, hardware, um, that sort of side of the world, malware analysis. And then um, from there was able to kind of have opportunities to get to do more operational work um, and more research work as well. Married those two things up um, and sort of found my way into cyber deception. I was really lucky to have some great mentors along the way that helped point out opportunities and, and give me chances to be able to, to try learning these new technologies. And so um, really found deception, found it a really fascinating area and, and ran with it. Moretta, what just what is cyber deception sounds extremely cool, but just, <laughs> can you just let us know what is that? What is cyber deception? Yeah. My favorite way of describing deception is have you seen Home Alone? Yes. Of course. Okay. Um, yes. you know how they booby trap the house? I yes. get to do that to people's computers. And so <laughs> it's thinking differently about how we can um, be able to detect adversary um, activities within an environment, how we can drive up the cost to operate while driving down the value of those operations, and then how we can learn more about real adversary behavior so that across the board, our defenses can be more threat informed. So I say like that for the industry space that you're in, it's pretty cool that you've stayed with the same company since your original internship. And that's, yeah. that's rarer and rarer these days. I mean, what is it about MITRE that has kept you there? And then, you know, what have, have there been challenges or obstacles that you've had to overcome on that path? Yeah. So I think that MITRE is a little bit of an oddity in the space and that I'm not that different um, in terms of how long I've been there. And in fact, in compared to a lot of employees, I'm really junior. Uh, we have people 20, 30, 40 years at the organization. And so I think one of the things that really attracted me to MITRE is that you do have these people that are the top in their field and have been doing different things, um, completely different from the things that I'm working on, um, but are a resource that I can go to, whether it's because we're looking for subject matter expertise on a project, whether I'm just interested in learning more and they're you know, having a technical talk, um, that you have sort of these deep areas of technical expertise throughout the company um, so that I always tell when, when my interns come for the summer, I'd say, you have to try really hard to be bored here this summer because <laughs> there's so much going on. Even if you hate your project, um, we can find something that you will find interesting and you're going to have to work hard to, to not be interested in something. And so I think that piece has been really attractive to me. The other part about MITRE that I really enjoy is our role as sort of a trusted advisor. So MITRE, um, if you're not familiar with how we sort of operate, we operate these things called federally funded research and development centers or FFRDCs, which is just a complicated way of saying um, we sort of have one foot in academia and one foot in the, the contractor space. Um, and we sort of straddle both sides to help the government with systems engineering and proof of concept and prototyping, you know, the types of things to help them understand, you know, they have a problem. What is the best way to approach that problem? And then the actual sort of production and long term O&M will go to the for profit contractors. But in our FFRDC role, we get to kind of be in that exploratory, more researchy phase um, to help them understand what the problems are and the potential solutions are. So really enjoy that um, wow. kind of more prototyping and, and research side of the, the work as well. Have there been for you, have you faced adversities or things you've had to overcome in that on that journey? Or have you felt it to be fairly you've been progressing fairly regularly? So I think one of the things I've been really lucky early on in my career at MITRE was to have some terrific mentors. And so um, actually my senior year, I was doing my senior design project at MITRE um, because a couple of folks who um, had been sort of management and um, whether it's people management, technical management, um, wanted to kind of help me with my projects. And um, then once I transitioned to full time at MITRE, those same folks kind of really helped me identify opportunities and find new ways to kind of engage with the large body of work that is MITRE. I think MITRE is a place where having a network uh, is really, really important. 
uh, because so much of our work is sort of driven by what are the different technologies and subject matter, you know, areas that our sponsors care about. And I will preface, I keep saying the word sponsor. So at MITRE, we refer to our government customers as our sponsors. So that is where that term is coming from. I'll try to use customers, um, but it always (laughs) feels weird to say. Um, So I think I I was really lucky. And so I've had a lot of different opportunities pretty early on in my career that um, really helped me be able to um, excel and to drive into new areas and be able to take more leadership roles because I had management um, that really gave me a lot of leash early on. Um, I had one manager in particular, uh, Stan Barr. Dr. Barr is kind of one of the um, the uh, heads of MITRE's research program right now. He runs our critical infrastructure research um, as, well, as well as been involved in our deception research for a really long time. And um, he used to, you know, give me opportunities to present or give ideas that um, in all reality, it was probably pretty early in my career for for me to kind of be given those opportunities, but um, really let me kind of jump into the deep end and then was also always there if I was floundering and, you know, drowning to, to pull me out, but give me the amount of space that I needed to, to make the mistakes, learn from them, figure out how to not make them again, but then also you know, not have it be career detrimental either. Um, so really appreciate that support that I got. And, and I think MITRE has a lot of people like that who really value intellectual curiosity and really mm. want staff to be able to have the space to explore that, but also recognize that, you know, junior staff are going to mess up and we're going to need help and, and they'll be there to pull you out on the other end. I feel like that's a key part of mentorship that maybe isn't discussed as much. You you, you need to have someone that can see the potential, like the place that you can get to and you might not even realize it yet and kind of throw you into the deep end, like you said, to give you those big challenges that push you forward. For sure. I I think it's so important. And I think it really helps staff realize what they can do um, because oftentimes it's not that they're not taking advantage of an opportunity. It's that they might not feel that they can or should. And having someone to kind of give them that push to say, you know what, try it for that job or go give that briefing um, can be what they need to really be able to find a, a huge opportunity that leads to other things. That's also so, I mean, the story you tell too about you have the two summer internships and then you stay engaged your senior year and they're willing to work with you. That's important because this episode will come out in the summer and there'll be a lot of folks who are doing internships yeah. or in the cyber community who are working with interns. We always say to our interns, don't forget when you go back to campus, we have an interest in you still. We want to help you. Please call us, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. end on August 1st. That relationship can continue. And that's a great story, Moretta, that you you benefited from that. Oh, I, I say the exact same thing to my interns. And I always tell them, you know, if over winter break, you're, you're looking to pick up, you know, 10 hours a week of work. Give me a call. I always <laughs> have things that need to be done. Um, so I, I think it's hugely important. And it's a great um, sort of ability to get ahead of the job market too, right? If you're looking for internships mm-hmm. in your year and you're actively still at companies, you never know who you're going to meet or you know what other events you're going to get invited to. So I think it's a, it's just a great opportunity all around. So kind of rolling back the clock a bit and speaking of some obstacles and how you've overcome them. Uh, I know as part of the NeuroSpicy Brigade myself, uh, I understand that as a kid, you dealt with ADHD. And I'm curious if you could talk a bit about how that impacted you. Yeah. So uh, if it wasn't obvious from the fact that I'm involved in a million different things and constantly (laughs) bouncing between a million different things, um, I, I have ADHD. But I will say I was actually only recently diagnosed. So it wasn't until um, I was almost 30 that I, I got that diagnosis. How the heck? Um, I never realized it about myself before then. It kind of uh, makes me laugh now looking back. And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, how did I not realize that? Um, but I, I think a big part of it is um, just how much, you know, we have this image in our in our society, in our minds of, you know, what ADHD or any of the, the neuro spicinesses look like. And a lot of times folks don't quite fit into that mold. So I wasn't the kid bouncing up and down in the back of the classroom. I was the kid zoning out because I was thinking about 10 other things based on like one comment the teacher made at the beginning, um, which mm-hmm. was no longer relevant, but I've now missed like the rest of class. Um, <laughs> But I managed to get really good grades because I was also really anxious about getting good grades. So I would go home every night and like read the textbook myself from start to finish because I could hyper focus and, and read, mm. reread the book. Right. So it wasn't um, kind of manifesting in the regular ways that we 
think as a society that these different things come out. And I think it's really important um, that as we're learning more and kind of as a society able to talk more about these things that, that we have a chance to sort of share our experiences and um, be able to help someone else not wait until they're 30 to realize and be able to put systems in place that help them out for before that. Um, so I think for me, there was a lot of things that my ADHD made more complicated in my life um, and a lot of things that it's helped me do. And I think um, one of the nice things now is that I'm starting to learn, you know, how to make it work for me where I can and then how to put structures <laughs> in place when I can't. Um, but definitely um, there was a lot of time spent uh, teaching myself material because I didn't spend quite enough time in class actually paying attention <laughs> to what was said. Um, and a lot of time spent dabbling in 50 million things versus like, you know, the topic I was actually supposed to be learning. Um, but I think what's nice now is in my role, because I'm not meant to be um, sort of seeing a project from start to finish, oftentimes my role is to come in, help get a team started, give them sort of that subject matter expertise, come in and help for the parts that are kind of that creative process, and then 100% step back and say, someone else needs to keep the train on the tracks, because if I'm driving, we're driving off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> But that's, but that's great to be able to recognize that, right? You're the activator, which is an extraordinary skill. And there's a lot of project managers that don't have the activator skill. So let's make a team where mm -hmm. activators get to work with project managers and we'll figure it out, right? It, it just, it works. Yes. And I am, well, I am a strong believer that every role needs to have like co or deputy or whatever the organization wants to call it, because you're never going to find all the skill sets for, for one role in a single person. And so I am constantly looking for kind of my compliments um, in the skills that I'm not so good at, right? The the project mm -hmm. management where it's finance or task, uh, checking in on tasks and delivery dates and the rest of it. Um, so I have some people that are fantastic at that and they love to do the detailed oriented, like, did we do everything on this checklist for this task versus my brain is like, I paid attention to checklist item one and now I'm <laughs> off on the next thing. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think that's really important. And it also is a great opportunity, again, going back to that mentorship piece. I oftentimes like to find folks who are coming up the ranks who have those skill sets that I don't have um, because it gives them a chance to really that's you know, so own something and sink their teeth into something um, because I, I can't help them with that, um, but I can that's still be point. there to kind of help guide and, and advocate where needed. That's a great point. The, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about Engage? Because I mean, that that's there's a lot of collaboration going on there. You tell us a bit more what it is and kind of what it does. Yeah. So MITRE Engage um, is our external set of resources around cyber denial, deception, and adversary engagement. So I talked a little bit about um, you know the home alone analogy and all that. The way I like to think of denial and deception are sort of two pillars um, that when we bring them together with strategic planning and analysis really allow us to have those bigger threat informed impacts where we're setting goals and trying to make progress towards them. And oftentimes, you know, we think about deception. A lot of the vendors um, who have awesome products out there are kind of um, selling these really technologically advanced or really complicated things. And that's great for the more mature organizations. And that might be something that, you know, the larger guys are able to really run with. But oftentimes these technologies don't need to be that complicated, right? If you think about, um, you know, detecting adversary behavior, maybe that's as simple as I have a folder on my CEO's desktop that says my tax documents here. And the CEO knows never, uh, she should never, you know, click on that, that folder. And there's no reason for anyone else to be on the deck on that um, desktop. But if that folder gets accessed, now you have a high fidelity alert that someone's poking around. And you can kind of draw that out to maybe it's a network share that looks like it's some really interesting research project or really interesting, you know, HR data or whatever it might be that actually has no um, kind of real purpose on the network. And so how can you think about making these tripwires? And we talk a lot about also thinking about what are real adversary behaviors. So I think a really great one is, you know, a lot of organizations, um, individuals will all have admin access um, regardless of whether they actually need admin access on that, on that station, right? And so if you think about, okay, of these users, how many of them are ever going to be running PowerShell commands or, you know, running different very commonly used lateral movement or discovery commands, and then putting tokens on those laptops so that, you know, if someone does try to run Who Am I, you have a high fidelity alert. None of these things are complicated. It's just a new way of thinking about the technology and thinking about, um, you know, how we can home alonify um, <laughs> our, our networks and also bringing in a lot of the things that we do all the time in home security, right? If we are going on vacation, leaving your lights on a timer, um, putting the radio on when you leave the house, putting a sign out front that says this home protected by ADT, 
none of no one considers any of that breakthrough, <laughs> but we don't bring that to the cyber world. And so um, a lot of times it's just how do you bring that over, even though the I always tell people I'm an ops guy, right? Like I'm I'm not doing cutting edge research or writing IEEE papers or, or the rest of it. Right. I'm thinking about how do I put an ADT sign in front of my computer? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a really approachable way um, to have an impact on cyber. I love these down to earth analogies. I think it makes it a lot easier to understand for people who might not be technical. Mm -hmm. um, I, I particularly love the home alone analogy. Um, and I have to say of all of Kevin McAllister's innovations, I personally like the scalding hot door handle. <laughs> Um, do you have a favorite innovation in your engaged toolkit like that, like a favorite tripwire? Yeah, I think one that I think is really interesting is um, using fake credentials. So a lot of times um, we actually were just talking with an organization that didn't have two factor. And the reason had nothing to do with technology. It had everything to do with a policy problem um, for their users. They, there was a bunch of kind of steps that needed to go through before they could implement two-factor and have the users actually need a second form of, of authentication. And so they came to us and it was after they'd actually implemented it. And they sort of said, you know, what could we have done? There was two years that we didn't have two-factor in place. What could we have done during those two years? And so um, we sort of sat down and said, well, if you had scattered decoy credentials throughout the network and monitored for those decoy credentials being used, you would have had a high fidelity alert that something had mm. gone wrong and something oh. bad was happening. And it wouldn't have, you know, it wouldn't have fixed your two factor problem. You still need to be making progress to implement, you know, two factor, but it at least would have been that canary in the coal mine in that time between when you identified the problem and you were able to fix it. And I think um, decoy credentials are a great one because, you know, credentials are stolen credentials is such a commonly used adversary tactic. And so um, it's a, it's simple. It also has a lot of opportunity to sort of get ramped up as in maturity. So baseline is I, I scatter some decoy credentials around and I monitor for them to be used. Great success. Step number two is, okay, and I swap them out every X many days. So now not only do I know that an adversary got in, I know when they stole the credential or what the time frame was, and I know where they stole it from. And, and you can kind of think about moving That's these cool. things up. Like I put some of them in my email, right? I have two admins sharing a password. Well, now not only do I know that, you know, the, the credential got stolen, I know that someone's accessing emails, right? And so you can start a, start to kind of build and kind of ramp things up so that you can have a nice bite-sized chunk, but then figure out how to roll it into something bigger down the road. Wow. That's really clever. I love it. Um, it's fun. It's creative too. And I think that's what, what's fun about it. Cause it also, the whole point of adversary engagement is to not have everyone thinking the same way. And so if everyone implements right. decoy credentials in the same way and puts them in the same places and uses the same credentials, it's not as useful when you get people thinking creatively and, and figuring out, you know, what works for us and what's more realistic in our organization. Um, you start getting a lot of really creative things that allows that bigger impact. I feel like that creative thinking is um, what's been sadly missing in a lot of these cybersecurity conversations over the years that, like, I don't know, everybody wants to implement something that's real fancy and technologically advanced, but sometimes the real solution is something very um, low tech or just kind of outside the box, low budget. <laughs> And, and I think that's what you just said was huge, that the low budget piece, because most of the organizations don't have a budget, right? You're, most of the organizations that I work with are lucky that they have a cyber person on staff. Most of the time they have MSSPs, but it might not even be, you know, it's a small portion of their budget. And so um, how do you create solutions that are sustainable and maintainable for these organizations? You know, it's not the big fancy tech. They can't afford it. They can't implement it. They can't monitor it. I can't tell you how many organizations I've talked to that say, yeah, we have logging, but we don't have the staff to look at them. So they just sit mm. there. And if we have yeah. an incident, like they'll look at the logs, but it's wow. not until there's an incident. And so mm -hmm. that's not helpful to be proactive. And so being proactive has to be simple. That's a huge problem too, for where we see it as legal counsel to those companies is you knew enough to have logging and turn it on, but then alerts would happen. And it would be, it was as if you're just like publishing a newspaper, no one read. Mm -hmm. it, it, which is almost worse than not having logging at all from a liability perspective. So it, that sort of thing. It's like, all right, if you're going to, if you have a hundred dollars in your budget and you're going to do something for $90, you know, don't think you're going to have $10 left to monitor that thing. Right. Maybe let's do something a little less ambitious, but put a little more money for monitoring. And 
so that when fires go off, we have fire extinguishers. Yep. Um, the other thing I want to comment on that you said that I is the, the creativity piece. In so many parts of cyber, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul when it comes to mm -hmm. staffing, right? So we always talk about the talent shortage, but all we're doing is taking technical people from one area that is also short people and throwing them into another. I think yeah. with the creative parts of deception, there's opportunities for human behavioral scientists. There's opportunities for graphic designers and visual designers. There's opportunities for you know this huge range of folks who aren't normally part of cyber um, mm -hmm. to be part of the the process and part of you know creating these solutions. So I think that's another really cool, exciting thing to me is just it actually opens up new new opportunities to expand the community and expand practitioners. Yeah, I love that. I feel like. We definitely need more of that interdisciplinary approach for sure. We've been too siloed for too long. We took the metaphor of like the hacker in a hoodie in a basement and like made that our entire <laughs> ethos. Yep, for sure. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, can you give me your favorite example of a project where a collaboration with an outside company turned out very positive? Yeah. Um, so actually, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to present on this um, at, at ShmooCon, which is one of my favorite hacker conferences. And I'm so sad that it's ending this year. I but um, well, we can be sad about that one um, <sighs> was actually with HSBC. So uh, it sort of seems funny that a Chinese, ba Chinese bank based in London um, and MITRE are working together. But um, we actually had a really successful um, relationship where their cyber threat intelligence um, organization um, has worked with with our team to do different deception related operations and be able to share it publicly, which is was really great. So we actually um, ran um, a sample where we had a malware sample. Um, we were setting up what we call isolated engagement environments. So these are they must describe it as um, a sandbox on steroids. So it's isolated from the network. Um, has all the controls in place to be able to monitor and watch what's going on. But the intention is that it's not just detonating and watching what's happening. It's actually trying to elicit additional engagement. So there's stuff in the environment for the adversary to go after. There's, you know, things that make it look lived in. And it really gives us a chance to understand not just how that sample of malware works, but, you know, what happens next. And so we've done some some really cool research um, with them and we were able to present on it at ShmooCon where not only did we um, sort of see this process, we actually were able to um, kind of understand more about what was happening. And in, in one of these operations, um, they had run a piece of malware, their EDR solution didn't detect um, the specific uh, technique the adversary was using. They passed the malware to us. We ran it in our environment. We also, we had a different EDR solution. We also didn't detect it went back, were able to actually go back and understand what was going on and then contribute to attack uh, a new sub technique based on what we were seeing. Um, and so the the sort of history of attack, um, and if you ever heard Adam Pennington, the attack lead talk about this, it's really fascinating, but it was born out of MITRE's deception program back in the day. And so it was at a time where MITRE wasn't talking about the fact that we were doing these sorts of isolated um, engagement environment operations, but we were learning all this valuable um, information that we wanted to share with the community. And so attack became our way of doing it. Obviously, today, attack is much bigger than it was when it first came out. Um, and, you know, deception is no longer the lion's share of, of how we're getting information. There's so many contributors from around the world, but um, we still are able to add new things to it, like that new sub technique that I was discussing before. Reda, Reda you're like at the forefront of a lot of the new technology. You talk about stuff that is now commonplace, but you're also at the forefront of some things. How do you like, are there things that you're working on now that are sort of theoretical that haven't had applications that you think are like really cool that you could share with us? Yeah. So I'm actually involved with one research project right now. So we're looking at um, sort of um, alternative uh, ways of deploying deception. And so looking at um, SDN software defined networking as a means of deploying um, network based artifacts. So um, there's been some work going on in that for, for a bit now, but excited to sort of be part of the team that's looking at new applications and, and new ways of doing that, as well as sort of how that marries up with traditional like host based deception as well and, and bringing that all together. That's awesome. Very cool. So, um, just to go back again to be, it sounds like your your passion for computer science maybe wasn't immediate. Maybe you resisted a little bit. Can you tell us about that? Like, what was that like and why did you initially resist it and what overcame it? 
Yeah, so I, this is a, the perfect topic. Um, so at the time of the recording, we're coming out of Father's Day weekend. Um, so I actually, my dad is a was a computer science major um, oh. in grad school, worked in computers his whole life. And so clearly um, nothing your dad does can be cool. And so <laughs> I wanted nothing to do with computer science uh, up until I started college um, because, you know, that was dad's nerdy thing. And so um, I actually went into school thinking I was going to be a mechanical engineer my um, sweet mate at the end of my hall took a computer science class. So at Tufts, uh, which is where I went to school, all of um, the en- first year engineers take sort of survey classes and you don't actually declare your major until the end of your first semester. So I was sort of in general engineering classes and he you know, wouldn't stop talking about how great his computer science class was. And uh, a couple of times I'd like kind of sit in while he was doing homework or whatever. And I was like, all right, that is kind of cool. And so um, <laughs> took a class my next, my next semester and just really fell in love with with the the discipline and had to make the fo- the phone home to dad to say like <laughs> hey dad you were right i really like this i'm sorry for giving you crap all those years um but um, <laughs> you're, this actually is interesting so um that's kind of how i i wandered oh, wow. into cool. computer science and then um the cyber stuff as i was talking about before really did come from miter Moretta, did he play it cool on the phone or did he take a victory lap uh, he played it cool, but like right. you could you could hear the victory <laughs> lap happening. Uh, oh, he tried yeah. to play it cool though. Um, I think the real victory lap was the next time that him and his work buddies were all talking about you know the latest like bug or something, and I could actually join in in the conversation. Oh, yeah. He was pretty happy about it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but I will say he's a mainframe programmer, which is still he's it it hurts his soul that I didn't learn like Fortran and COBOL in school. Oh my god! Um, I think I think he was gonna like ask for his money back on the tuition when he was finding out that you know that wasn't a a staple of every computer science degree. So uh, he's still he's still a little bitter about that. That's awesome. I feel like the only people who uh, think that everyone needs to learn those languages are mainframe programmers. <laughs> no, he's not wrong. Like they are, there is such a huge demand and I'd probably be making a lot more money if I hadn't. <laughs> That's okay. I'll leave that to him. <laughs> Sometimes we do ask people to come on the show, what, what would you, what was the one thing you'd recommend that, that, a, that a young person learn? And then they say Fortran oh. and they explain you, they explain it for that, for that purpose, which is it. I mean, it's, it's not like wrong. the opposite of what you think. Right. But it's, it makes sense. Oh, they can't hire people fast enough. There is no one. So, and those systems aren't going away anytime soon. It's like <laughs> learning Latin, right? You're always translating original text. Mm-hmm. Well, um, all right. So we're going to take a short break now. And when we return, we're going to, uh, we're going to put you through the lifestyle lifestyle polygraph. So please stay with us, everybody. You're listening to the No Password Required podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. Welcome back. As many of you know, the lifestyle polygraph is a test used by the federal government to determine if a person is worthy of learning some of our nation's most important secrets. Here, we use this technique for slightly lower stakes to determine whether our guest can join our fantasy cybersecurity squad. Moretta, are you ready for the lifestyle polygraph? Let's do it. Awesome. All right. Question one. As a part owner of a dance studio in the Boston area, can you share a little about your passion for dance and what inspired you to open your own studio? Yeah, so um, I am a part owner in a ballroom studio called Ignis Arts um, in the Boston area, and we're actually um, brand new, so very excited to, to be in the new role. Um, so I actually, as a kid, did martial arts my whole life, um, and wow. uh, similar to the computer science, my dad did martial arts, and so I wanted nothing to do with martial arts until about 11, <laughs> and then finally went to martial arts class and was like, wow, this is great. So I, I don't learn from my mistakes, clearly, um, but what I, one of the things that I, I really loved about ballroom dance in particular, and partner dance is, you know, just how much of the physics and the um, kind of body mechanics from the martial arts translated over into something completely different. And so uh, if you had asked 15 year old me, if I would wear a long dress and heels and dance around a room, I would have laughed you out of the room. Um, And still some days I'm like, am I doing this? Okay. Um, But I I just, I absolutely love sort of the the physics of it and and the ability to kind of work with another person and and to be able to move um, and then to be able to do it all to music um, to me has just been um, a really, really kind of exciting and and, um, interesting way of applying um, a set of, you know, um, athletic skills that I had. Um, And what I really love about partner dance in particular is 
there's a huge community of people who just go out and do this for fun, right? There's a bunch of us that compete yeah. and there's a bunch of us that just go out on a Friday night and go dancing, um, sometimes in places that are scheduled for dancing and sometimes because there's just music playing. And so that community aspect has been um, just really uh, something that I fell in love with as almost as much as the, the dance itself. And so um, when we started our studio, it really was because we, we loved dance and we also felt like we could build up a community of people kind of that are um, looking to support artists and support um, local dancers. And so part of the philosophy of our school is to make sure that all of the artists that are, are part of the school as teachers, as event organizers, um, receive kind of a, a higher than living wage. A lot of times cool. these folks um, aren't really paid that much for the work that they're doing. And so we wanted to kind of create a community that um, really brought that to the focus. And so it's been really fun to be able to do that. I absolutely love that. That's awesome. I have a, we, I have a partner uh, who I work with who's um, a, a, an Aikido specialist and has done it for years and years and years. And his partner is a dance instructor. Mm-hmm. And he has talked about exactly what you're talking about, Moretta, which is why they have so much in common, although it doesn't seem like it on the surface. Is that and the, the conversations I think that they have are just beautiful because it's a lot about mm-hmm. what am I going to do and what's the other person going to react and it's a neat mm-hmm. thing that that you're marrying it so directly like that. It's really cool. Yeah, it, it's it's really cool and I and I think the other piece too and and fighting has this and then dance has this. Um, it's it's a weird form of social interaction that doesn't actually it has rules and doesn't require like direct talking all the time and so the the breadth of different people that are part of it. You have everyone from sort of. I did ballet and, and, you know, when I was younger through, I'm an engineer who just was looking for something social and like the structure of, of dance. Um, you know, I, I think that that's really cool too. And it's been a, a fun part of it as well. And that's a little bit, and this kind of overlap with what you do on the regular basis for your living, right? With the tacit cooperation, right? we're going to try to find a way to yeah. communicate good and bad, but without explicitly saying what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep, for sure. All right. Question two is sort of related. If you were invited to be a dancer on Dancing with the Stars, who would your dream celebrity partner be and why? Okay. So first I'll preface this with, while I own a studio, I am not by any stretch of the imagination a pro dancer. So the poor celebrity that is partnered with me is in for a rough ride because I'm not that much above amateur. Um, So I'll I'll preface with that. Um, But I think if I had to pick a celebrity... I would go with Dan Radcliffe because, I mean, who doesn't want to dance with Harry Potter? Right. Also, the theme song to Harry Potter is a, is a Venice Waltz. And uh, dream is to dance that one day as wow. like a performance piece. But if I can like wow. sub out the, the pros that I normally dance with and throw Dan Radcliffe in there, like I'm, I'm all over it. Let's do it. <laughs> that would be amazing. It's a waltz. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes <laughs> sense, right? I never put that yeah. together. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a Viennese waltz, so it's it's faster than a, a slow waltz, but uh, it's it would, it's a little challenging, but it's fun. <laughs> it's cool. And he's got theater training too, so I bet he's got some dance, mm-hmm. yeah, some something in the back. I bet he would be awesome on that. I yeah. feel like he would be, and I mean, there's a little bit of a height difference, but we we can get over that. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so. Three is also indirectly related. Since <laughs> you're here with us today, it's safe to assume that your Hogwarts letter is still on its way, as are ours. I check every day. I know. I keep waiting. <laughs> uh, holding out hope, though. So once you finally get into Hogwarts, which house do you think the Sorting Hat will put you in? And what kind of mischief do you see yourself getting into? Okay. So I have definitely never thought long and hard about this all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, I it, dep- it sort of depends on the day and when I answered the Pottermore quiz. Um, but um, it was usually uh, Gryffindor or Ravenclaw. So I go slight, slight. What am I feeling more today? I don't know. I feel like I'm way too impulsive to be a Ravenclaw like through and through <laughs> and um, getting into like way too much trouble that I, that I shouldn't get into. So it probably gives a slight edge to Gryffindor, but like hopefully with slightly more common sense than most of them, but like marginally. Um, <laughs> and what, what trouble would I get into? I mean, I feel like it has to be something cyber related. Like we never hear about what the network was like. Yes. About- 
Right. right? right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I feel like they think that with their magic, they're not worried about like APT threats, but mm-hmm. I, I feel like, I mean, there's a lot of data there. They've got, you know, I mean, the sorcerer is not alone. <laughs> right. The flu, the flu powder network is just wide open. Yeah, wide yeah open. exactly. So I feel like I would do something to mess with the networks if I'm going to be getting in trouble. Um, that's probably it, which I guess you shouldn't admit in a poly that I'm hacking networks, but you know, it's fine. It's not, it's not a real poly. (laughs) Kaylee, are you, have you done it recently? The Pottermore quiz? Not recently. Generally when I take it, it puts me in Gryffindor first. (laughs) Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same way. Cause I always, I'm like, if there's a question where I can get glory, I always say I want glory. But then if it goes too far to one ambitious, I'm like, no, I, that's going to be a Slytherin question. I but I feel like the kind of person who answers it not to get Slytherin, probably is Slytherin. That's the thing. My second is always Slytherin. So yeah. Slytherin the way I make peace with that is just, I mean, Harry Potter was the same. It's fine. He was supposed to be in Slytherin. They, he got put in Gryffindor. So you know what? I'm fine. I'm in good company. <laughs> but it, that, right? It's the ambition, right? That's what they say. Exactly. I, it's the ambition. My kids did it yesterday again because they they always have this fight about who's what, and the kids are always um, there is Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw, and not, they, I have three kids. None of them ever get Gryffindor or um, or Slytherin, but my wife is hardcore Slytherin. She's like, look, she's like, I'm going to get trained in magic. I have to tell you, right, right, like, you know, we're already yeah. not playing by the rules. Slytherin, it is, and so I've got to deal yeah. with that on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. Right. I have to say, I, I, I've i always wished I was in Ravenclaw. I own a few little things from Ravenclaw, but it's just Pottermore has never rewarded me with that. So I just have to be happy with where I'm at. It knows. It knows all. It knows. <laughs> it doesn't take your preferences into account. It no, it doesn't. Like, listen, I know who's behind that. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> All right. Number four, you have a unique way of reciting the alphabet. Could you share how you developed this special talent? Yes. So my go-to special talent question, whenever I'm asked, um, what's your special talent, is that I can say the alphabet faster backwards than I can say it forwards. Wow. Um, and so it's not as impressive as it sounds because when you say it forwards, you default to like the song, right? So the yeah. parts of it slow down. But when you go backwards, your brain doesn't do that to you. So yeah. you can go faster. But the reason I learned how to do this was because, as I said, I was in martial arts as a kid. And our sensei used to do like little challenges that were just meant to, you know, make like test your discipline or your, you know, just you know, stay out of trouble. Um, And so one of them was if five of us, uh, I think we had like a week or something could learn how to say the alphabet backwards without looking at it. She would give us a pizza party. And so as a chronic overachiever, I not only wanted to learn how to say it, I wanted to be able to do it as fast as humanly possible. And for some reason, my brain has retained that knowledge, Um, not like useful knowledge. Like it'd be great if my brain could remember, you know, things that mattered or, you know, you know, the fact that I, you know, left the stove on, but it can't do that, but it can remember how to say the alphabet backwards. Brenda, I want to imagine that there's going to be a time when you're going to be on Dancing with the Stars and someone's going to be like, who are we going to assign to Dan Radcliffe? And then someone's going to say, all right, he's got this weird thing. The first person who, the fastest person to recite the alphabet backwards, that's who's going to be partnered up with. I love and it. You're going to say, I got this. I was <laughs> born for this. Dan Radcliffe, here I come. <laughs> Oh my God. (laughs) All right. Final question. With your growing dance empire and impressive achievements in cybersecurity, you're on the path to becoming a Boston area icon. Who are your top three all time favorite Bostonians? And the producer has made a note here. Please do not include Tom Brady as he is not a Bostonian and he belongs to us in Tampa now. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, I will fully admit I'm not, and I, I don't know if I can say this that loud in Boston, so I got to like make sure no one can hear me. I'm not a huge sports fan when it comes to like, you know, Red Sox, Patriots, Celtics. So Tom Brady wasn't on the list, so he's okay. <laughs> um, which I can't say, like I said, I can't say that too loud around here or someone will like egg my house. Um, <laughs> but uh, if I had to pick top three Bostonians, so I'd say I have to start with 
John and Abigail Adams, because, okay, so fun little anecdotal facts here. Abigail Adams grew up in my hometown. And Mm. so growing up, we learned a lot about Abigail Adams because like that was the only useful thing to like talk about historically in Weymouth, like kind of random town. Um, And secondly, my grandparents' house, the apple trees in the back um, were originally part of the John Adams um, estate. So grew up having apples from the original John Adams apple orchard. So feel, feel some kinship to uh john and abigail there and then let's see i think all right this is bad because i should have double checked that he's actually from boston but in my brain chris evans is from boston i'm pretty <laughs> sure that's true and i'm gonna assume it is i'm just gonna that's in deception fair. if it's not um <laughs> but uh we're gonna go with that because i mean captain america like yeah. how do you not pick captain america that's like Fair Clearly, <laughs> the whole package. That's what the he whole- is. <laughs> That's right. I'm just hoping he finds his Abigail Adams out there somewhere. Exactly. Or John Adams, or whatever he's looking for. <laughs> My, there's a book that I love. I think I've talked about it in the podcast before, but it's the collection. It's called My Dearest Friend, and it's a collection of the letters between John and Abigail Adams, and it's unbelievable. No. She was, she, they were so cool. Those two. I mean, they. They really spoke to each other with great reverence and respect. I think they probably knew that their correspondence would get published one day, but Hey, that's cool too. Right. They were, they were writing with posterity in mind. It's like, and it's the kind of thing you can dive into and read a couple pages and it gives you a sense of, wow. All right. You know, people are decent and they treat each other decently. Yeah. I I know exactly that book. It's a great one. Again, anything that had any Abigail Adams, we did in history class because, you know, again, there's not much in Weymouth. (laughs) We got Abigail Adams. I also love the idea that you can have the apples that John Adams had. That's right? so cool. like that's such a good neat like callback to a historical moment where we don't get as much of that anymore. Like, to eat or drink the things that they had at that time. Yeah. Put yourself. I will admit the trees are probably nowhere near as good. They were kind of like crappy apples <laughs> at this point in their little apple lives, but um, it was still cool. Uh... <laughs> All right, so Kaylee. Is Moretta able to join our cybersecurity team? You know what? I I feel like her adversary engagement skills are pretty valuable, not to mention all the other amazing skills, but I have to say her dance skills are also a pretty nice bonus. (laughs) You won't be bored. And we, if we exactly. get bored, we can start dancing. It'll be great. Exactly. <laughs> so, Moretta, thank you so much for joining us today. If our listeners want to connect with you, what are some ways that they can do that? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn, so that's probably the easiest one. I'm pretty sure I'm one of the only Morettas and definitely the only Moretta Marvitz. So you can find me there. Um, also, the Mitre Engage LinkedIn, um, if you reach out through there. Um, and then you can find me um, at engage at mitre.org. It's probably the easiest email. Um, or mmoravitz at mitre.org. So my first initial last name at mitre.org. Um, and all of those will go to me. Thank you very much, Mara. That was awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank this is great. <laughs> all right. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, but first, Kaylee, what did you learn today? Today, I, I don't know if it was learned, but um, I was reminded of how uh, those of us with neurospicy brains uh, like ADHD, um, we absolutely fit in in very special places and are, um, I don't know, the things that are considered symptoms or disabilities are actually our strengths a lot of times. I really appreciated how she turned her natural intellectual curiosity and uh, go-getter spirit into an amazing career. I just want to, you know, say a word in, in my capacity at the at the law firm where I work, Carlton Fields. I'm the hiring chair, and so I deal with our summer associates every year. And I just want to reemphasize to everybody listening how important it is after the internship period ends, both for the interns and for those who've had the interns all summer. Please stay in touch. Uh, there's really nobody else that the companies have. Right, that's the the next generation of folks. And similarly, like when you go back to college or wherever you're coming from, where you were an intern. Stay in touch with the people that you worked with, right? Um, one, it's, uh, it's it's a mercenary thing to do if you want a job. But two, uh, that's where you stay in contact with your mentors and your sponsors. And, you know, keep the thread up, stay in touch, stay in contact. Don't let 
um, some will be the end of things. And I think Moretta's story today is like a very specific example of success that had, you know, in some part due to that relationship continuing into her senior year. Well, for the entire No Password Required team, I'm Jack Clabby. Thank you all for listening, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. You can find us on social media at No Password Pod. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the No Password Required podcast. And if you know someone who might like it, please share it with them. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. And a special thank you goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website, cyberflorida.org slash pod. All opinions expressed by the No Password Required podcast participants are their own and do not exclusively represent the views and opinions of Cyber Florida.